afternoon, everyone. My name is Sharon Spencer Fox. I'm a librarian here. And I want to welcome you all to our conversations on social issues today. Uh, just a little reminder, we see this series as an extension of the library's mission, which is to provide multiple viewpoints and the open exchange of ideas. And just as we do that as we buy materials for the library, we do that here by offering the space where we can hear multiple ideas and exchange ideas. Um, so this afternoon, we have Dr. Suzanne Griffin, and she will be presenting on the impact of education on the status of women in Afghanistan. And she's the former Dean of General Studies at South Seattle Community College, just across the way. We know them. So welcome, Suzanne. Thank you, Suzanne. Well, good morning. It's great to see you here today. And I'm going to, um, uh, I just, I've been in Afghanistan 11 years working. I left being a dean to do this work. Um, I took a week for a while and then finally I just left <laughs> because the opportunities and the need were so great and um, I should say that part of my reason for going to Afghanistan in the first place is that my late husband and I were in the Peace Corps there and so I speak the language so that's a helpful thing. Um, I'm going to, this is not the one I prepared for you but I came across this this morning when I was saving it and I thought it might give you a <coughs>
Um, this is what a girl's calligraphy class looks like. We'll talk about that in the next. You'll see some of these in, uh, images in the one I did for today. I literally forgot until this morning that I'd ever done this presentation <coughs> because I guess um, this is uh, the good news is that um, girls start girls are in school. Um, but they start dropping out after third grade, and we'll talk about that in the next presentation. And the big factor is the presence of female teachers, not surprisingly. Uh, this is one very, I just think about her all the time. This woman is a mother of nine. She is teaching uh, teacher training with me in a, in a remote area. If you look again at the middle of Af Afghanistan, it's called Tukstar. It's on the uh, opium trail from the south to the north. I didn't know that right away. I had an experience one day where I wondered why there were so many extra money changers in the bazaar. The governor called me and said, we're giving you protection today. I didn't know why. And he said, because the opium's coming through today. So anyway, um, she, we had to reach all teachers in this teacher training program, all teachers in the two provinces I had. That was over 7,000 teachers. She was, um, she agreed to be the one that would be the one female trainer going out on donkey through the mountains, over through the snow to train. She lived, in, we had a guest house and she lived, um, there, since she was her own, we had 17 male trainers. She had a little room all by herself, and when I stayed there, it was barely went big enough for both of us to be in it, but we had our little place to shower, and that was enough. Um, this is, we've set up, this is a big, big, huge step in, in Afghan women sharing. Uh, it's a, it's a win-lose kind of culture. If I, if I shared with Nancy, my lesson plan, um, then I risk maybe losing my job to Nancy. That's how I viewed it, instead of something that we could do together. Okay? So we had to get them, it took a long time to share and not to, to realize that they'd all be richer if they shared and it wasn't a win-lose situation, it was a win-win. Um, this is where we have, um, most of the teachers are grades one to four, and grades one to three. We'll talk about that a little later. And that's because during the Taliban, of course, women can go to school. And so they, to have, to teach grades one to three, one to three, this runs contrary to what we knew about research and education, but it's assumed that you don't need to know too much to teach grades one to three, so they put the women that didn't have a high school diploma in teaching grades one to three. Countrywide, that meant for most of the 60% of the female teachers were teaching grades one to three. And then everybody was blaming girls dropping out on the culture in grade four. Well, that's a mixed answer. Actually, they dropped out because they could only have male teachers. And in the remote areas, girls do marry young, even though the Constitution says they can't, shouldn't be married until 16. They can marry as young as age 12 in the remote areas for mostly economic reasons. One last mile to feet. Um, so the, this, these numbers are old, that's why I did the new one, but basically uh, as of 2008, only 10% of the kids going to high school were girls. That number is now up to about 20, 25%, which is a huge, huge, huge thing in the country. Um, Um, this, I just thought through this, and even though it's all men, but you might want to see what teacher training looks like there. Uh, these are Tajik men, these are in that same place, Tuxars, and uh, their turbans are like this big. So when I'm talking to them, since I'm not exactly a giant, I'm like looking up to them, trying to tell them that I'm in charge. <laughs> I, do ha I did have the money, so that's the bottom line. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at the training, and one of the things I was working on here, we worked on group participation because they don't have any experience with that. And um, 
And basically, this is the status of teachers as of this era, uh, as of 2008. Is that most of them didn't have a chance to get the get a high school education in in the in the rural areas because if there was a high school, it was for boys. <clears throat> and the girls that did go to high school, and this is the thing to know about it. You know, behind every girl with an education, there's at least one male figure in the family that insists she have it. And it often is the father, but not always. It's sometimes an uncle, sometimes a grandfather, and sometimes, surprisingly, a husband. And these, uh, one place I went, I remember it's, it's um, not too far from Shippagong, but it's very remote. You get floods and you've got to go across rivers and all that stuff. And anyway, these men actually had a roadblock to make every driver uh, that came along that road give money for the building of the girls' school, which is pretty great. And when we had literacy classes, um, the literacy classes to be safe, because it was well known that if a woman went to a public place without a male, uh, male family member that was trusted, she was a bad woman. So they didn't want that to happen. So what happened is wherever we had money to, with my Rotary Club and with the foundation I'm on the board of, we get, got money for literacy classes. Well, to keep them out of the public eye, men in the family, often the grandfather, would allocate a room in the house to be the classroom. So that if strangers asked why all these were, women were coming, and just say, well, they're coming for a party, you know, in our house, which is they have a lot of parties in their house. So it, the men have to cooperate for this to change. Um, this is women learning about science. You can see how thrilled they are, <laughs> or not, they're scared. We're, we're um, working really hard on um, participative learning and learning circles and uh, hands-on learning. So this is one of the things. What? Was that fire on the next? Yeah, that was a fire. No, that was just, it was a Bunsen burner fire, you know. And she, it, it was an experiment where you were finding a flashpoint. So, um, this is probably one of the saddest mornings I ever had there. I was asked suddenly to go to look at this project in terms of the setting up a rotary club there to see if the rotary club was funded. And I suddenly found myself having just gotten up about 10 minutes before in a room full of disabled women. And the stories were just, uh, they would lift up their chadres and show me their injuries. And it was just, and this was a training program to help them be self-sufficient because in the Afghan culture, typically, if the husband dies, then the husband's brother is supposed to take care of these women. But uh, because of the war, there were so many families that didn't have any women to take care of them, and the country had to deal with, they had no cultural mechanism for dealing with the fact that um, the woman was going to be the supporter of the family. And so, uh, you know, being the supporter is a big jump. Being disabled and the supporter is an even bigger one. Um, these are the things that are being done. Um, to help Afghan women increase their situation, better themselves. We have community schools, um, uh, and those are still, those are less necessary now, uh, unfortunately, because there is this kind of backlash happening in, in, with the Taliban. Now they're becoming necessary again. There was this time from about 2008 till 2012 where there were so many Afghan girls going to public schools that it became okay. But what's happened is there's been this backlash again coming back, and so some of the girls are going to have to retreat to the community schools again. And this is particularly true of girls that have uh, passed puberty. That they're, because in community schools, we can mandate that the instructors be women, and they're usually supported by um, international NGOs. Um, and then they have this accelerated learning project for teachers. One of the things that happened, uh, the, t the female teachers are key to Afghan girls getting more educated and therefore getting more jobs and getting into the society. But 
because of the Taliban, they, as I mentioned, didn't get any schooling, or if they did, it was underground. And so then, what we had to do was, um, when the certification process came on, and I was asked to help with that, and that was in 2010. No, I'm sorry, 2008. I was asked to help at the end of 2008 with the teacher certification process. And this is where I, the MET thing comes in. Um, there was a big meeting of all the donors from all the countries. There was a new minister of education who happened to be so, someone I knew very well. I'm the only woman allowed is a big Pashtun clan. Uh, there are 70 women in it and me. And because I was, I worked with two of the members of the clan, one of whom was now the minister of education. He saw that my face, I always said there's this huge, everything in Afghanistan is very, you know, okay, like the head guy is up there, okay? And then in a pecking order down the road, it's all, every room is like this, forget this round table and, you know, nothing egalitarian about it. And uh, so I was there uh, to answer questions because the teacher education department who set this up were worried that there were gonna be questions from the donors about the research behind what they were proposing. That was my job. And he saw that my face did not look enthusiastic about this. So as we went out the door, he's one of those kinds of leaders who wants to shake hands with every bloody person in the room. He said, all right, what's wrong? I know your face, I've seen you so often. Uh, I said, the women are gonna fail this test, uh, this certification thing, because they didn't have the education. So what would you do? And I said, I'd slow down this whole process, even though I'm the one that helped develop it, and I, I uh, get an accelerated learning project for the teachers going. And he's the kind of leader that, he, he smiled and said, okay, and you never know. And then two weeks later, everybody's like racing around saying, we got to get this accelerated learning project going. So here is a very powerful man who without, a, he, and he's also from an area with a lot of Taliban. Without saying a word, he just changed a bureaucratic process. And bang, all of a sudden, all these teachers that were going to flunk got two years of what's equivalent to a crash GED course so that they could pass the test. And as a result, now that he's minister, they've gone from 20% of women being 20 to 22% of female teachers to his goal is to get to 40%. 50% is a stretch. But they're now at 30 some percent. So it's because of what he did. Okay, and um, higher education, this has changed now. But when I was asked to be part of the strategic plan, those were the numbers. Um, I was asked to help with the Mystery Pirate strategic plan, and I read their numbers, and it just exploded. They said at the first line, equal education for all. And I just went up to them one at a time at tea time and said, look, these are your numbers. And I'll, I, you can read them. Okay, not a, only one full professor in the whole country. Two assistant professors, and half of the, the universities had fewer than eight faculty, and three had none who were women. I said, we all know from the elementary secondary that the women can't come and, and thrive if there are any female teachers, and you've done nothing to make this happen. And ultimately, what happened was I won't go through all the details, but I wound up with on a governance subcommittee with the Afghan women that should have been in the first meeting, but everybody said they weren't there, I said, I'm sorry, I go to this pirate department periodically and they're all in their offices, I've seen them. So we got a 30% quota for every single thing and then it's in the five year strategic plan for women. Scholarships, study abroad, promotion opportunities, placements, and so forth, none of which they had before that. And this is, shows how far we can go. Herat, this is in Herat. Herat is probably the most um, open place about women's education, even though there's a heavier and heavier every year that I've been there, influence <coughs> of the uh, conservative Islamic, um, of, uh, Iranian, is the conservative 
from is Iran have had a more of an impact in the in the ten years. I can see it every time, based partly on how I have to dress to succeed there. I now wear the full shador that, that you've seen the black one when I'm there, so that I'm indistinguishable from any students. Okay, but the clothes aren't the whole thing. In spite of all that, Iranians and, Af and Haratis have always valued women's education. So the most educated women in Afghanistan outside of Kabul are in, in Herat. They're lucky because in their, in their high schools, they have huge high schools with thousands of all girls high schools, thousands of girls, all the women are well educated. And it's because, and this is one of the things we all in this, the West have to get over. Don't just assume because someone wears something on their head that they don't care about education, because they do, they care a lot. And, and especially if you look at the stats on Iran, Iran has more women, percentage-wise, more women doctors, more women lawyers, more women teachers, law professors, et cetera, than we have. So we need to really kind of click that, don't judge by appearances. You know? um, so, and this is women in the health professions, which are were working really hard. Um, I found myself unplanned, but in charge for almost three years of a women's health project. And um, it's because they knew how to train, but no one knew how to write curriculum. And also because they needed a manager. But um, because of a lot of, again, the increase of women's education, there's, there used to be no female nurses, now we have some. There used to be very few female doctors, now we have a lot, it's been almost a flip. There's actually almost, in some places, more female medical students than male. And this is, uh, now they're taking a role in actually um, making their environment. This is a, a group of female medical professionals help, helping set the standards for nurses training. So they're right there at the table with the, well, with the men, I think. Yeah, they're all women in this tape. Um, this is something about Afghan women in the workplace. That because of the whole thing of honor and, and uh, the feelings about not having your women in your family, particularly in Pashtun families in the public eye, the workplaces that women can succeed, ironically, are very actually allow them a lot of power. Some of the younger women have figured out that if they get a degree in accounting and finance, they can work in the finance department and who actually controls everything, right? Mm -hmm. So in or office after office, you may not see very many women out front in a bank, but why they're in the back room. Mm -hmm. And what's really changed in Kabul mm -hmm. is they're also in the front room and it's just I just sometimes, I go to an Afghan bank, I have an account there, and um, it's a big hassle to go, but I like going because I know that um, I'm going to go over and like one of the approval people, they have to approve your passport and all that, there, it'll be the women. And I just love standing there watching this big, big bunch of men coming in and it just kind of like, oh my gosh, I can't get this woman's approval and she's like about 20. You know? <laughs> so um, it's 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 a good learning curve for all of them. But also the reality is now the realization that what they can do when they get a chance for an education is pretty important. Um, you'll be surprised to know that the Constitution has uh, several sections that directly address things that affect women. One is the marriage age is 16 by constitution, and that is now being litigated in the courts, and they're winning. So um, it guarantees, this is something we don't have, and I've actually, at some big forum at the UW, I asked this question, I submitted this question, no one wanted to answer it, U.S. Department of Ed was there last year. In the Afghan constitution, everybody, male and female, has the right to a free education through the bachelor's wouldn't that be wonderful if we had it? The yeah. richest country in the world. Mm -hmm. They're the poorest country in the world. Mm -hmm. But they're committed to that. 
And no, do they, does the government have its own money? No, but they aggressively go get that money from the European Commission, the US, wherever, to ensure that every single person that wants to go to the university can. And that's pretty astonishing. A lot of the African countries also guarantee that. I, I don't know which one, but I know that I had African housemates who told me this was common in their country as well. So we need to look at that. 25% um, of the houses of Parliament are women. What percentage of our house, our Congress is women? Does anyone know? 3%. Yeah, it's about 17% overall. Afghanistan is currently at 27%. They've gone above the constitutional requirement in both houses. Houses, they have the lower house and upper house, which is like our house and Senate. 27%. And they're, I cannot tell you, they're, I mean, a lot of these women are illiterate. But all of us who know research, and my doctorate was on research on literacy, there's of course no relationship between intelligence and literacy. Lots of people are intelligent. Who are not illiterate, are not literate, and these women in the parliament are proving that they are making big waves. It's really great, um, and their exercise. The governor of Bamiyan is a woman. Uh, she's Hazara, which is a, min a, a minority group. That she's ethnically a minority. She's religiously a minority. She's in a Shia Muslim in a mostly Sunni country. And um, she's a woman. But she has stayed in that governorship since she was appointed. And a lot of the male governors have been changed or run out of town because they're corrupt, but she's just there, just doing her job. Um, some of the, two of the, uh, this, this has changed. Now, Karzai has, opposed, has appointed two female ministers, both of whom I know. It's really thrilling to know them. And um, one of them is a minister, one of them is a The other one is a woman who's a doctor who is Minister of Health, and she and I served on a bunch of committees together. And she's also an ethnic minority. She's Hazara, and uh, she's a Shiite, and she's from the Hazara part, from Bamiyan. But she's now in Kabul running biggest ministry in the whole country, health, public health. Um, there, uh, this again, I did before there were parliamentary elections, yeah, they, they, there were loads of women candidates and many of them won. They had to win, because that was the thing, they had the edge over the male candidates because of the constitution that said 25% have to be women, so they won, okay. Um, this is the progress they're making. The poor are still having problems uh, because of where they are. Most of it's related to economic, but they're making progress in health care. And um, the big, big efforts are being made to educate women, men on the rights to, of women. And um, it's key to progress. It can't be, it can't be this, uh, win-lose situation. It's got to be a win-win. And one of the things that, that I have to tell you is that mm -hmm. the middle class, I, because I've worked with teachers and university professors and doctors and then lawyers, they tend to be middle class. And I felt that it was much, as much my job to support women as to support the men that had the courage to go, you know, take the unpopular step of standing up for the women when most of their peers were not for that. Because they are actually is in much or more danger than the women. I have a really good friend uh, who has built girls' schools. And now, I mean, he's been getting death threats since I've known him for that reason. Night letters, how would you like someone coming to your house and leaving a letter saying we're going to cook you and your whole family because we build girls' schools in this area. So, But he just keeps doing it. Uh, this is just uh, intergen. Uh, this is a grandmother and her her granddaughter that I saw, and I just like that picture because it kind of shows the the grandmother reflects the the severity of war and poverty and but she's kept on, and the young girl thinks the world is 
is her oyster because she goes to school and her family has made life easy for her. She, her, her father is a friend of mine and he works in the counselor section of the ministry and in, in the U.S. Embassy. And his father kept the embassy functioning when the Taliban came and all the Americans were evacuated. So it's kind of a wonderful family to know. Okay. So that's that. Um, Okay, now I don't have to know how to change this to the next. Okay, thanks, Sharon. So um, while we're changing it, are there any questions that came up? I want to answer your questions, so I don't want to. Um, yes, Denise. So are you speaking Dari in all these situations? Do you ever use English in any Oh, way? I use English a lot. Uh -huh. But um, I use Dari a lot in the, um, when I'm in the, in the provinces. And what I've learned, the Dari is especially helpful to me because when I'm dealing with the really powerful people in the ministries, because of course wisdom, unlike our country, where we don't always acknowledge wisdom and, and among the older members, and, and Afghanistan really counts. And so the older men in the ministry, whenever there's something controversial going on, I know that the ones that have to be convinced are the older guys that are sitting there not saying much at the table. And if I can just chit chat with them at, at the tea break in Dari, it's amazing the difference it makes to bring them around. Because the other thing that, I mean, I learned Dari in the Peace Corps. But the other thing is, I just hate it when people put words in my mouth. And when I realized that I understood when my translators were not translating correctly, I just was really upset. And a couple times I've actually been giving a speech in this kind of setting where I basically have to just say that's not what I said. And a couple of times the translators have left the room in embarrassment. But, you know, I'm not going to. And it's scary, honestly, to think of what translators' power is. I just recently read a book where about uh, called In My Father's Country by the first female Pashto translator that was sent to work with the mil U.S. military in the South. And that Dari translators have been, quote, translating for the military to Pashto speakers. Well, the Dari people, that's why we were having so much trouble. Because they were not, tr they didn't speak Pashto themselves. So this, they, were, they were saying stuff in Dari to Pashto speakers. The Pashto speakers didn't get it. The Dari speakers didn't get what they said back. And we made terrible mistakes in southern Afghanistan because of that. I don't speak Pashto. I do understand about enough Pashto to know that all the guys that work with me better not say one bloody thing in Pashto around me because they don't know what I know and what I don't know, which is kind of neat. I, but I don't speak, <laughs> you know, because I have a lot of young, just, you know, college students working for me. And there are, they're just, there are a lot of them in computer science and they just think they're like the cat's pajamas, you know, they just think they're so great. And I'll hear them making cracks about the girls. And they're, the walls are very thin. They're right in the next office. And I'll just walk out and I'll say, you say that one more time and you're out of here. And they go, did you know what we said? And I said, yes, you should just be careful with that. What you say? <laughs> so it's, yeah. But dar having the language is a lot. Um, it just breaks down barriers. And also it, m it means that I'm not scared because I know what people are saying. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't have to say what are they saying because I know because I'm there. Okay, so I'm just gonna go quickly through this. Um, this is the first day of school. You've seen that one before. I like it. Do you see anything in the background that tells you it's definitely Afghanistan? A camel, the camels. I just love this. I mean, the camel. I was in heaven. I've always loved camels. I don't know why. Ever since I was a little kid. And. And in Shippagun, they're everywhere. And they're just roaming around, and they have babies, and I've never seen a baby camel. And so I love it that the camels are just like in the back while they're starting school. Um, there are now more girls than at any time. So you've heard the dire part first. No more girls than at any time in the history of Afghanistan. Free Taliban, free America, free Russia, free everything. Okay, which is pretty great. Um, the, the numbers vary. They're not precise like we are. They just will they'll say something one day, even if it on the ministry of Ed Web page, the next day it's something else. So it's about 36%. Um, they expect 10 million girl, kids to be um, in school 
by the end of this year. Again, you saw those women. That's how they were asked to teach. They wear veils. Uh, they do not wear those blue chavis. Those blue chavis are mostly worn in the country and in the remote areas. Uh, there are fewer and fewer in Kabul. They're worn in the bazaar because in the bazaar anything can happen. So even modern women wear those in the bazaar. I mean, if I had to go to the bazaar, I go to the bazaar, but I go to certain, well, actually, no, I go everywhere. I just, and that's the other side of being an older woman. I put on my scarf, I go to the bazaar, the drivers take me, the security officers don't know, to places that only Afghans go, because I pass. And they say hala hala, which means um, hala is, is auntie, but it's just kind of a, it's sort of what you would say to an older female relative, whether you were really the aunt or not. And so I know that I pass when they start calling me that. Okay, this is, um, these are the figures on illiteracy in Afghanistan. One of the sad things, I was looking back at the numbers when I was there in the Peace Corps, the numbers of illiterates actually went up between the Peace Corps and the Taliban. I mean, after the Taliban, the numbers were higher than, so all those years of education by first the US and then the Russians actually kind of went down the drain in terms of uh, illiteracy rates because the, the illiteracy rate among men and women was higher after the Taliban period than it was before, before way back in the late 60s. Um, but we, they have made strides. There's been massive ed, ed, uh, efforts to improve the literacy rate. And the target, the right now they haven't broken, the current figures, I don't know why, I'm, I, I think I know why, because it wouldn't look so good. But they, they have, um, combine the male-female literacy rates, and we're now at a 36% literacy rate for the whole country, and that's considered a, an improvement. Um, kind of a contrast, Sri Lanka, which has multiple religions, including a great section as Islam, is 90% literacy for women. So it's, it has nothing to do with the religion. It has to do with the culture. Um, mm -hmm. And I went to Sri Lanka, what a difference. Um, these are the female teachers. We're making some progress, and I already talked to you about the girls dropping out. Um, and we're making progress in those who are teaching to grow above grade four. Uh, Shivergan is a provincial city, which for a variety of reasons, a ge generally more educated group altogether, but the ethnic mix helps. I mean, there's Uzbeks, Turkmen, Pashtu, Hazara, and Tajiks, all six different ethnic groups living together in peace, which shows that it can actually happen. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the women are more educated, so the girls stay in school longer. This is, you know, the girls' school is just overflowing. They run shifts. And this is another example of how much that don't ever let anyone tell you Afghans don't want your, their kids to go to school. They want to go to school so much that where they can't build more schools, and they have some buildings, the first group is the boys, the older boys go to school at 7 a.m. And they're got done at 11 or 12. And then they run another shift. It'll be the little kids usually. And then the girls are, they'll mix it depending on the season, if it's light or dark and so forth. But Basically, some school, lots of schools run three shifts a day in the same building. Okay, um, this is the Ministry of Education Women, and this is what I mentioned that with the support of Afghan men, girls are going to universities. It took Afghan men to make the strategic plan. Um, I can tell you that I was the only woman in the executive group there. They said there were no Afghan women interested or something. I was so upset. Anyway, um, so, but the, you can see that they're making progress. In 2012, the numbers were up of girls um, enrolling in the university, although it's still only about 25%. But that's still better than men, you know, so we got to take a look at it. Um, this is, um, I always wondered what I'd look like if I had been a nun, and now I know. <laughs> this is, uh, I was wearing the hijab in Kandahar because they're close to Quetta. Um, when they didn't want me to make a speech in the Shagri because they didn't want that 
anywhere seen. I mean, they wanted me to come to Kandahar. It was very risky. I did it. The guy behind me was my deputy, and we went as if I, I did. I did when I shot him in the airport. The blue thing. Was because we uh, we went as if we, he, I was a rel female relative. We, we flew without any security. Uh, we went on a local flight, bush plane, and we went in. And I did it. I did it because I wanted to make a point. I wanted to be the one. They wanted me. The embassy wanted me to go with the ambassador, blah blah blah. And I had to wait. And they needed that thing open then because I would have had to wait three months. They needed that lab immediately. So I went and it was to send a message that it was for men, women, women and men. And so um, it was me and 400 men and two other women, one of whom you'll love. They couldn't figure out this woman until after I told them. One was a USA representative. I asked her if she would please take her flat jacket and helmet off while she made a speech. They'd send a very good message. Because we were in a big a library, actually. Um, and the other was a soldier in full battle gear, and she was a part of the security guard. And I was getting kidded by my male staff about why I was talking to one of these, quote, American soldiers so much. I said, because she was a woman. They could have just talked I mean, She was a veterinarian <coughs> who had been sent to Kandahar, because it's an agricultural area, to improve the veterinarian practices. She was as short as I am and lighter weight, but she had full battle, you know, full battle gear on so she was bigger. But it was another good lesson for them. Okay, um, this is just turning my I can't see this. Okay, these are the professions women are entering now, and these are all culturally okay. Medicine, law. They can be they can make huge changes. And it's because of education. And what's happening now is the med the the, um, the middle class and upper class men want their daughters educated because they understand with education comes power, and it's all about family power, not just individual power. So the more women that are educated in their family, the more power their family has. And what are they doing? Well, they're getting better health care. <laughs> They're actually challenging roles. There's a, there's a family law. Karza refused to allow a domestic violence law to be written. But they're going up, they're using the family law to start to, they started to win domestic violence cases. University of Washington, um, it's, I wish they publicized it more, but they're, they're enormously influential there. They've been running the Rule of Law Project, which I helped them write the first so I just gave them some advice about culture and stuff. When they wrote that, that was around 2003 or 4. They've been there. We've got University of Washington is quietly sending law professors over there sometimes for months and sometimes only for a few weeks. But throughout the country, they have this rule of law project going on, which works at showing how Sharia law and international law can work together. It does not have to be one or the other. And it is really, it's going to change that country enormously. And they're just quietly doing it. One of my friends, some of you know, Patty McLaughlin, she's written the ESL parts of the law. Uh, uh, they have to learn English to read the law books, and she's done it. Um, and then computer science, that's another one. Um, they're getting full rights to come here in computer science. One little one that I know from Herat just got one. Um, business and accounting, and then library science. This next one I'll show you. These are some librarians learning one of the projects University of Arizona helped to start was digital libraries, because after the Taliban left, you know, they burned the books. So getting the libraries back in, first of all, the idea of cataloging the libraries never occurred to anyone. Uh, so we, um, the project I ran for WSU paid, we subcontracted the University of Arizona, and they have an Afghan librarian there who came, she's an American Afghan, and she came and helped train, and then we trained a, um, under, when I took it over from WSU, I'm all about sustainability. And so I brought it. I found this woman that just showed up. And she was Hazara. 
She had a master's in library science from the University of Mashhad in Iran. She is dynamo. Um, she is sustaining it. She's gone around the country training all the librarians, and uh, they know. And now we have a, we have a digital. I mean, this old hat to you, but we have electronic check-in and check-out system at the front desk at Cal University. Huge. Because up until lately, the library books were locked up because they might get lost. Um, this is the university educated women are taking a major role. I already talked to you about that. Um, 2014 elections are coming uh, in April. There will be a lot of women running, lots more than ever before, because now they've seen what women can do in the parliament. Women are making speeches every night on TV. Can you imagine? And um, this is one of my favorite days in Afghanistan. We had a master's in public policy and administration project uh, program that we uh, we did the pilot under WSU. Now University of Massachusetts is taking it over, and making it sustainable. But it was a partnership with Kabul University, and some of the the people in the group. There were 60 graduates, and I think 15 of them were women. These women were some of them. Two of them did their thesis under me. And um, it was just the happiest, one of the happiest days of my life to stand with them. I was exhausted by then, but um, to see them graduate with a master's degree, to know that these women all, and these were, this public policy part is key. We asked the uh, ministries to nominate the women, uh, the mid-level managers that they thought would make a difference would rise to leadership positions. So with these 60 people were critical to the future of this country. And that's what I want to leave you with is the hope is this group of kids that a may have had their childhood in a refugee camp but had their adolescence in a school in the in Afghanistan. B got to the universities and now they're out there ready to take over. They're used to working together. They're used to going to school together. Um, they're used to seeing foreigners. They know about the internet. That's the other thing we did. We put it in. They know about other cultures. They know what's possible for them. And um, they are going to be the difference. So um, I wanted to ans answer any questions that you have. I know that this has been kind of my, not my favorite way to teach. I, mean, I like to do group work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Marcia. So, how much time are you spending in Afghanistan and what's your current role there? Um, right now, I'm not there because I came home on leave and I wanted my, I had a big accident with my leg and I had my leg in a cast and I just got out in, in October. Actually, I'm going to Armenia first week of March for three weeks. But my main role there now is uh, by choice. I've just, Running a huge project is hard. So I'm on the, I'm called an English language specialist at the State Department. And I go in and I do um, a lot of intense work for however long they need me. I did, I help develop three. I mean, mostly in the classroom, which is where I'd rather be. Um, I help, help develop, I'm teaching teachers. I'm teaching mostly university now, university teachers. And I'm teaching them how to take over and, and like the one, I just wrote an article for the TESOL uh, ESP section on the Herat ESP project. They needed to learn English to, um, to read their textbooks. And the teachers didn't know how to teach ESP, so I did that. But it's, it's a consultancy role now because I'm really tired. When you're running projects, I mean, 18 hours a day is standard. Because what happens with the time is, especially when your, your headquarters is here in Washington State, because there's a 12 and a half hour time difference. So you work, you get up at six, you work a full day there, you have dinner, and then, <coughs> and then all the email from here comes in there, and it's eight o'clock at night, and you're, do, you're going to tilt from eight to midnight, and then you get up the next day and then you say, the other thing is, um, I, I'm, I did plenty of administration in this country. 
I'd really rather be back in the classroom. <laughs> and so what I'm doing as much as possible is taking roles where I'm either teaching uh, or mostly I'm teaching teachers and helping them learn how to develop material. So I expect to probably go back in June to Afghanistan because now I've taken this thing. I got notified that last night that the State Department wanted to go to Armenia for three weeks. <coughs> Well, good question. Okay, it's because I fell in love with, I was trying to join the Peace Corps, I fell in love with someone who was in the Peace Corps and I wound up in Afghanistan for my honeymoon. That's a short story. There's going to be a book comes out, um, Denise has it, if you look on, it's www, I don't know, what is it? www.susannamgriffin.com. There's a book coming out March 22nd that answers that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it's a memoir that I, what happened was my husband died in 1999, very suddenly. And I, when I went back to Afghanistan, all I could think of was the contrast. Every city I went to between what, what we experienced there, where we traveled, we had no security, no cell phones, no radios, just him and me. We were field, a field team. And so I was writing in my journal about this, and then some people in my life decided, convinced me to make a book. It took me 10 years to write it. Good question, though. But I went to Afghanistan. I wanted to join the Peace Corps. I thought they wouldn't take me because I'm allergic to mosquitoes somehow in my head. I thought all the countries had mosquitoes. And I just wanted to go and do good things. And it's, I'm part of that boomer generation that just really wanted to enlist. Your generation now is almost, to me, the closest to what our generation was. We were very, I was told from the time I was six that my job was to help the world. You know what I mean? In school, they would tell us stories about Africa and stuff. That's the long answer. Sorry. Anything else? Questions? Yes. How do you feel about wearing the the K or the man? Not. I. It was fine. I mean, I was fine. And you know, the first the first year, it was summer and it was hot, and I hadn't learned all the tricks. I mean, I couldn't understand why I was always just dying under the under a veil. But the Afghan woman worked. Well, you just put your hair in a ponytail. And I never thought of that. And I know why. I mean, there were a couple times that I almost fainted because the heat builds up. You lay the snow, right? And, and everybody was, and I just, and I thought, well, yeah. And so I usually have my hair a little longer than this, and I put it up. But actually, I felt, I really got to the point that I felt. I always go through this when I've been there a long time and I come home. I, when I walk out without something on my head, I feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, it takes me usually a couple weeks here before I can feel. I'm so used to wearing it because, see, when I taught in the university, I wore, I just wore it inside and out. Now, when I worked in an NGO office, we didn't. We didn't wear it in the office, but once I started working in government organizations all the time and in the universities, and I was out in the boonies, it was on my head, you know, every moment I was awake. Um, so, and I felt I felt safe because I could pass. So I didn't do the thing that a lot of foreign women do is they kind of like throw this little veil and they don't really. I really did not show any hair. Is that your optional or? Um, no one said we had to wear it, but we all knew that, that we should. I mean, it's just respect for nothing else. Yeah, so, but no, nobody said we had to wear it. But, and that's, I mean, that's something I learned way back in the Peace Corps days. And also I was in Iran for, for, for eight months. Um, I remember when I came out of Iran that somebody asked me that I was interviewed on a radio show. And, um, I said, no, it's not, I mean, the fact that I have something on my head is nothing about oppression. It has to do with um, respecting the beliefs of the people that are the majority that I live with. And also, because these were my lady friends. I mean, I didn't want to go to a restaurant with them all in with scarves and me not. First of all, they wouldn't have gone with me if I didn't have a scarf on, because it would call attention to our group. 
But if the ladies wanted to go out for lunch, and I wanted to be part of it, and I was the only one invited to go out for lunch with them, because I wore the scarf. That's a good question, though. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, if they're like, uh, the ones have to wear them. Yeah. Yeah. But I never do that if like another person from the United States has to follow the same rules. No one said I had to. But, no, I, I know. Yeah. But, uh, I thought you had to follow the same rules. Well, I guess if I didn't want to be, well, yeah, if I was teach, well, they wouldn't let me teach if I didn't have a scarf on, I'm sure. I mean, I think they wouldn't have let me. But, you know, we never tested it. You know, it's just like, okay, fine. I'm gonna, all the women in the room have a scarf on, I'm going to have a scarf on. Mm. I had tons of them. I decided as long as I, I was going to have to wear A lot of us did that. I did what the afternoon room do. You make it a fashion statement. I had a scarf for every dress or whatever else, tunics I had. You know, nice color, summer, winter, spring, and fall. They're, they're lightweight and not be heavyweight and all that stuff. So, right. Sure. Yes. Uh, what were the most obstacles uh, that you faced in the gangsta to practice your project? Like the color, is there all the culture or uh, religion or language barriers? Security. And, uh, yeah. That's it. Which one was the most helpful for you to practice your The project? most helpful or the yeah. most difficult? Uh, the most helpful was the cultural value for education among educated people. The least helpful was the issue of security and still is. I mean, yeah, the, the, the most helpful from Afghanistan that to get to, that helps you to, to practice your project, not for the, you. Yeah, no, for, it's their value, the men's value for education and their families. The men's, the male, the males of course is supposed to protect their families and take care of their families and make their life better. And what helped me the most is when I was running into problems with education, I could go to a, a male figure, usually it was a head of Ashura, Ashura is like the community group, I would, I met a lot with the Shura members, and once they supported it, then everybody supported it. So they were extremely helpful. And I think that's, again, one of the things that um, too many aid agencies miss out. The ones I worked for, uh, some of them did, and some of them help, I helped them get to that, but that when you go in with a new project, the first thing is to go talk to the Shura. But we became like partners, like in terms of supporting the schools. Mm -hmm. They were the ones, because the ministry didn't have enough money to pay enough staff to support the schools, but every community had a Shura. And so I'd go and, you know, they'd sit down and they'd say, Suzanne, we need a library. And I'd say, you know, my money won't let me build buildings, I, I, but I can give you the books, for, get the books to the library if you build the library. So they get a bunch of guys from the community and they build the library. So, does that help answer your question? Yeah. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, well, I'll stick around for a few minutes if you have something you don't want to ask in front of the group. You, you had a question back there, right? No, I was just Oh, okay, good. Thank you very much. It's great to have you.